Good evening. Tonight's story belongs in the Now It Can Be Told department of the 1st Naval District. It all happened when you folks were asked to cover your windows with blackout curtains and dim the headlights of your car. Remember the wardens who pounded on your door if a stray light was accidentally left burning? There was a good reason for all this. And no man knows it better than Everett Gallagher of Gloucester, engineer of the fishing boat Iolas. This trim little craft belonged to Captain John Johnson when she was shelled and sunk by a Nazi sub on June the 3rd, 1942. And before that, she belonged to String Griffin of Swampscott, who had her built, I think, down in Friendship, Maine, long about 1922. She was 62 foot long, carried three drags for scooping up fish off the bottom, and was driven by a 100 horsepower diesel engine. In other words, she was a typical Gloucester dragger, and could, with luck, bring back from the week's fishing trip about 50,000 pounds of fish, all dressed and iced up. Now, besides Captain Johnson and Everett Gallagher, the engineer, there were four other men in the crew. Kenneth Cantbell and Harry Shields and two local Portuguese boys named Town in Piaria. They'd been making around $100 a week on redfish. But the 1st of June, 1942, they decided to try for ground fish as there was a big demand for it and the price was better. The night they sailed on June 1st, something happened that will always puzzle Engineer Gallagher and Gloucester's superstitious fishermen. Mr. Gallagher, I should explain, is the local agent for the Wolverine Engine Company and knows his engines like I know my camera. When the war came on and there were no engines to sell, he got himself a job as engineer on a boat with one of his engines in it. And he kept that diesel running like a well-regulated timepiece. Captain Johnson had told the crew to be ready to shove off around 6 o'clock that Monday night and all hands were present. But when Gallagher threw the switch, something went wrong. He had a sticky valve, the first he'd ever had on that engine. So he fixed it, gave her the gun, and then the oil pressure dropped. Turning to the skipper, he said, Captain, I don't think this boat wants to go out tonight. We've never had trouble like this before. He wiped his hands on a chunk of waste and said, I'll be back in a minute. I'm going up to the house and get a new check valve. He kept a lot of spare parts in the basement of his house on Rogers Street in Gloucester, and in his haste to get back to the boat with a new check valve, he forgot to turn out the light in the cellarway. Well, he replaced the valve, tuned her up, and by gory, one of the brushes on the generator failed. And it was then that Gallagher knew something was going to happen to his boat. Captain, he said soberly, I guess we're jinxed. Three things in a row. Something is trying to keep us from sailing out of Gloucester tonight. Well, finally, after repairs had been made, they got underway and headed in the general direction of the Cape Shore fishing grounds off Nova Scotia. On Wednesday, June the 3rd, approximately 100 miles northeast of Satcher's Light, one of the crew called the captain's attention to some lumber floating just ahead of them. They slowed down, went through it carefully, and noted it was good, clean timber, apparently just off a schooner. And then they saw patches of oil and a lot of wreckage. Submarine, the fellow asked, could be, the skipper said grimly, as he went around another batch of boards and splintered woodwork. About four o'clock in the afternoon, the sound of gunfire came rolling over the smooth sea. It was a fair June day, bright sun, light breeze, and good visibility. Gallagher said, there's some firing off there, Captain. And the skipper said, yeah, I heard it. Probably coast defense guns, a target practice. But a few minutes later, when he heard it again, he turned over the wheel and went aloft to look around. What he saw would chill the blood of any skipper. Off to starboard in the distance were two vessels, a small boat enveloped in smoke and flame, and a much larger, longer ship that was shelling her. The little vessel was the Gloucester fisherman Ben and Josephine. She was sinking in a lake of blazing oil, while her crew took to their boats, dodging machine gun bullets from one of Germany's newest and most powerful submarines. As Captain Johnson watched, the firing stopped, and the sub got underway, heading directly from the Iolas, the little Gloucester dragger. The captain had hardly climbed down to the deck when a shell screamed over the stubby mast and burst with a bang and a reddish glare against the clear blue sky above him. Into the door is men, he shouted, and make it snappy. Gallagher rushed below, shut off his engine, grabbed a half a dozen packages of cigarettes and a five-gallon jug of drinking water. Then he returned to the deck, dropped the stuff into a dory, and ran forward to the pilot house. He made a grab for the compass, forgetting that it was screwed to the bench. There wasn't time to get a screwdriver, so he wrenched it loose, and as he did so, a hail of bullets struck the pilot house, showering his head and arms with splinters. He called the little white spit dog, the mascot, come spotty, come quick, and he ducked as another burst of shell ripped through the flooring, killing the little dog in his basket and tearing out the opposite side of the wall. When Gallagher came out on deck, the big Nazi sub was in plain view, and it was bigger than he'd imagined any pig boat could ever be. A wicked-looking deck gun pointed straight at him, and a dozen or more men were lined up along the navigating bridge. 
One of the men was grinding away with a big movie camera. And as Gallagher raced across the deck to get into the dory, he could see the machine gun that had sent bullets ripping up the deck just a few inches behind his flying feet. Then the Nazi gunner turned his attention toward the pilot house, and the name board, with Iolas painted in big letters on it, was shot clean off. It sailed through the air and landed in the water just beyond the two dories which had been hastily put over the stern. Now in one dory, three of the crew were already rowing away from the doomed fishing boat. In the other was one of the Portuguese men and Captain Johnson, who stood waiting for Gallagher as he held on to the scuppers. As Gallagher started to climb into the dory, the gunner on the submarine sent a shell from close range right through the dragger, and the concussion knocked Gallagher overboard but into the dory. And all this time, the Nazi photographer was grinding away with his movie camera. Gallagher was badly injured in the blast. He has never recovered from that fall. Maybe he never will. I went down to Gloucester to see him a few days ago, and he told me what happened to the six men after they took to their dories 150 miles east by north of Thatcher's Island. He said they pulled away from the sinking Iolus just as the sub moved in for the kill, sending 17 shells right through the vessel and spraying the water with bullets as the cameraman still turned his crank. Slowly the fishing boat fell and sank on an even keel, and the sub turned seaward and disappeared. Now the survivors started to row towards Seal Island in the Bay of Fundy, 35 miles away. But after an hour's hard pull southeast by east, they had made no headway. And by mutual consent, they gave up the idea of reaching land that night and headed back northwest by north toward the coast of Maine. Captain Johnson and Gallagher had the compass and the water jug in their boat. So the skipper shouted, keep close together, boys. When you need a drink of water, just yell. And when the sun goes down, we'll tie up together. Darkness came on and a cold, wet fog rolled over the sea. The two boats were tied together with 25 feet of line so that rowing was very difficult. It was cold, too. And as the men had abandoned ship without coats or oilskins, they were soon chilled to the bone. But they took turns rowing. The night wore on. Another day came. About three o'clock that afternoon, the fog lifted a bit, and suddenly the men heard the faint hum of an airplane. A moment later, it broke the clouds not more than 500 feet above them. A Canadian scout plane, an amphibian. And as it circled three times over the dories, the men stood up, waved their arms, shouted and made signs that their own boat had gone down and that they wanted food. But no sign of recognition came from the plane. And suddenly the amphibian was gone and the fog rolled in again. At least this plane gave them something to argue about. Some thought they should stop rowing and remain near the spot where they'd been sighted. That's the only thing to do, one of them said. They'll go in and report us and a boat will be out here in no time to take us back. The others said, no, we'll drift too much. They might not find us. And supposing the boat doesn't come, we'd better keep rowing. So they bent to the oars. And all that afternoon, they rowed and rowed and rowed. And with darkness, the second night, rain came. Cold, stinging rain that slashed at their faces and filled their shoes in the bottom of the boat so they had to bail with their little tin dipper and carefully cover their precious matches as they struck them to look at the compass. In spite of his injuries, Engineer Gallagher took his full turn at the oars rowing till his hands were blistered, and with every pull, the pain in his side and back almost knocked him out. During the night, they all heard at the same time the low, hollow sound of a foghorn. Mount Desert Rock, they shouted. Hooray, now we'll make it. But the sound grew fainter and fainter. And they began to argue again. That ain't no foghorn. We're just following a freighter. That horn should be getting louder instead of fainter. Listen to it. Listen to it trail off. They were grim now and worried. They knew that sometimes men in the small boat on the open sea mistook the whistle of a steamer for a foghorn on land and rowed after it like a will-o'-the-wisp in the night. But just before daybreak, while the black sky and tossing water met dead ahead, they saw a tiny spark of light, Mount Desert Rock, sending its welcome gleam over the wild, rushing waters. You know there's no wharf at that lighthouse. And the exhausted men just rowed in on a wave and tumbled out from the ledge scraped under them. In the early light, they saw familiar faces Glosterman from the Ben and Josephine, sunk by the same sub that had attacked the Iolus. The light keeper and his wife made the men comfortable, gave them hot coffee, while they waited for the Coast Guard boat to take them to Southwest Harbor, where intelligence officers were waiting to question them about the size of the sub, her guns, which way she went, and dozens of other questions. When the interview was all over, the survivors had a chance to know what the Red Cross can do when a guy is cold and wet and hungry. The local chapter in little southwest harbor, Maine, had everything, it seemed, for their comfort. Warm, clean clothing, hot fish chowder, big cups of coffee, and in the high school, 14 cots were set up for the crews of the two Gloucester fishing boats. 
And that wasn't all the Red Cross did. They hired a big bus. And when the men were rested and able to make the long trip, they rolled out of Southwest Harbor for their home port of Gloucester, where the grapevine had already carried news of the sinkings. They were met by a motor cycle escort of police and convoyed to the Chamber of Commerce for a grand reception and welcome home. I wish I could tell you that the sub was captured or sunk, but the Navy has no such record. All told, 12 vessels, totaling 165,000 tons of shipping, were sunk by submarines right off this coast. 205 brave men were killed, and 4,500 survivors of other sinkings in the Atlantic were landed in Boston and other New England ports. So you see, folks, the Navy knew what it was doing when it asked for the dimming of lights along the shore. And that brings me back to the light that Mr. Gallagher left burning in his cellar. His wife went calling that night, and while she was gone, there was a practice air raid alarm and blackout. And when the warden saw the cellar light go in, he busted the door down at Gallagher's and extinguished the light. A few days later, a patriotic neighbor said to Mr. Gallagher, Folks ought to be more careful with their lights these days. Why, I wouldn't be surprised any day to hear that one of our Gloucester boats had been sunk by a Nazi submarine. Engineer Gallagher gave a weary smile and said, Neither would I. He had to keep quiet then, but now it can be told.